the final night and no one slept. There was no way to hide from the coming day. Outside, men shouted and tortured wood with saw, hammer and nail. Banging and hammering punctuated and pounded the slow hours to morning. All night long, the sounds told Kate they built the scaffold for her aunt's execution. The other women tried to rest in the antechamber while Kate and Meg stayed with Aunt Nan in her bedchamber. Sitting close together, they talked of small things but avoided what they would soon face. When the conversation lulled, Aunt Nan at last picked up her lute and played, strumming, strumming love songs for hours. As dawn approached, she lifted her head. I have a new song, if you'd like to hear it. She brushed her fingers against the strings. I wrote it on the other night, I thought my last. Her mouth trembled. Mayhap this night too will prove not to be my last. She sang her song for the first and final time. Oh, death rock me asleep. Bring me on my quiet rest. Let pass my very guiltless ghost out of my careful breast. Ring out the doleful now. Let it sound my death tell, for I must die, there is no remedy, for now I die. Defiled is my name, full sore, through cruel spite and false report, that I may save for evermore, farewell to you, joy, adieu, comfort, for wrongfully you judge of me, unto my fame a mortal wound. Say what ye list, yet it may not be, ye seek. For that shall not be found. Aunt Nan always sang beautifully, but never as beautifully as that dark, dreadful night. Like an angel she sang, pure and heart-touching, like one who'd already left life behind. Her narrow face tense with thought, she seemed a sprite, or spirit's flame, not of this world. She still played her lute when Master Kingston and Matthew Parker came with the guards lighting the way with torches, their footsteps advancing closer and closer, the bell tolling out the hour. With the last toll of the bell, a group of men gathered at the open door. Very still they listened for a time. One guard and then another watched the Queen with, a, with faces alight with pity, but some could not hide that they admired her. I have seen many men and also women executed, said Master Kingston, and they have been in great sorrow, but this lady has much joy in death. Not answering Kingston, Parker came into the chamber and shook his head. The hopelessness of the good father twisted a knife into Kate's heart. She covered her face everything in her desiring to scream out no she should have known the death of george bullion had snapped the last straw of hope for reprieve her courage retreating in a tidal wave of emotion kate reminded herself that women in her family faced their fears with bravery she would swim and not drown. She would survive this awful day. She would survive for uh, her aunt, for her mother, for Bess, who would soon have no living mother. Aunt Nan stopped playing and straightened on her stool. The silent men approached. Master Kingston bowed, followed by the priest. Madam, Kingston said, your chaplain has come as requested. Laying down her lute beside her, Aunt Nan rose with a welcoming smile. That I see, Master Kingston. She held out her hands for Parker to take. My heart is glad to see you, Matthew. We have much to speak of. She turned back to Kingston. How many more hours do you make it, good sir? He shook his head and straightened his shoulders. We've been told to make ready for the ninth hour. He swallowed. Forgive me. I cannot even vouch for that. Aunt Nan sighed. It cannot be helped. The good father will give us solace as we wait. She frowned. Is Cranmer still coming to give me the host? Aye, madam. I request a boon for, of you, Master Kingston. When I receive the host, pray remain here too. I wish you to witness my confession so you possess no doubt about my innocence and the manner of my death. He seemed 
to shut away his thoughts, but even so, Kingston nodded and bowed. As you wish, madam. I leave you now with the good father. Expect my return at daybreak. He bowed, he bowed again, exiting from the chamber with the guards. As if her legs refused to hold her up any longer, Aunt Nan collapsed onto the window seat. Father Parker stepped towards her. Your Grace, have you not slept? She nodded her hands together on her lap. Sleep, Matthew? I'll soon have eternity to sleep. She gestured beside her. Pray sit, I wish to speak to you. For all that, she bowed her head and remained silent. He sat, folding his hands in his lap, and waited. And as he waited, he turned and smiled at Kate with compassion. At last, Aunt Nan lifted her head. Wavering candlelight danced shadows upon her hollowed face. Shall I speak now of my sins, Matthew? He stirred une uneasily. Your Grace? She smiled slightly. You have come to see me every day of my imprisonment. And we have been too long friends for you not to call me by my given name on this night of nights. Pray, put away the title. Tis worthless now. Call me Anne or Nan if you wish. I care not. Do not forget the king. My husband has taken back everything. Grief carved hot into her pale face. What did George say before his death? Trust in God and not in the vanities of the world? If only I had done so, I would not be here waiting to die. She licked it at the tears running down over her trembling mouth. I brought this on myself, on my brother, on my friends. Too many f heads now rot on the gate of London because of me. She bent her head and repeated, because of me. Kate shivered and not with cold. Five months before she had arrived in London, it seemed a lifetime ago, a lifetime since she first paid true attention to those very gates and saw the ravens flocking amongst the skulls, gore and blood. She imagined them feasting now on fresh black skulls, one the head of her uncle. Already his beautiful eyes would be gone, gorged out and eaten by the scavenging birds. Katie, how oh, Katie, how dare you grow? Uncle George had said to her, welcoming her, welcoming her that first day at court. He had laughed and lifted her in his, in his arms and kissed her. You make me feel old. Not so long ago a child, and now look at you, you're a young woman. She had made him feel old. She clenched her jaw, fearing any moment her teeth would chatter, and shifted around to Aunt Nan. Her ebony hair fell long and loose, undressed around her shoulders. Blue lights gleamed in her tresses whenever she moved. The candlelight showed her clear eyes, wide mouth and firm chin. The last few months had drained her of youth, but these days in the tower when the battle of survival finally approached a brutal end and there was nothing left to lose, had seen a return of her moments of true beauty. In the candlelight, she could be mistaken for a girl. Uncle George would never be old, and neither, it seemed, would his sister. Kate listened as Aunt Nan smoke spoke to her chaplain. She spoke first of the Princess Mary. On my knees, I begged Lady Kingston to go to her and do as I did to her and beg Mary for her forgiveness of what I brought upon her and her mother. She confessed to ambition and jealousy, the many, many angry words smoking, spoken in haste and now regretted. I have brought this on myself, she repeated again to her chaplain. But to die the death of a traitor? To, do I deserve such a death, my name blackened by lies? Adulteress? Foiled murderess? They wish, which they call me? My name is defiled, cruelly and falsely. She licked her lips and to die, knowing I've brought those I love also to death. To die knowing my daughter will be left motherless before the day is old. Mark Parker took her hands. Your sins are shared by many, but none give reason for this end. Aunt Nan turned towards the window, and Kate turned too. 
while still dark, the hour had come when all remained hushed and waited for the dawn. She sighed the last dawn for her aunt. Her aunt moved restlessly, shoulders hunched, mouth trembling. She gripped either side of the stone seat. Can love disappear like this? Utterly and without trace? She rubbed the side of her face. I did not love the king at first. I refused to listen to his promises. Believe me, Matthew, I sent his gifts back. But then he promised me marriage, a crown. Staring out into space, she twirled a finger in her loose hair. I did not know my ambition until then. Six years, six years to be ruled by ambition. Strange. By the time we did marry, I found another passion ruling me. She sighed. I love Harry. I will die loving him. I cannot believe he has stopped loving me. He swore to love me to his dying day. Pain darkened her face. She whispered, Perchance my Harry is dead. Parker leaned back, hand palm to palm. Fingers steepled under his chin. Perhaps he is. Since he came close to death early, earlier this year, I too have thought the king a different man. His desire for a son has become all to him. I believe he would do anything to beget his true-born son. He leaned closer to Aunt Nan. Even murder. Even murder, she repeated. Her lips twisted as she tasted, as if she tasted something, something vile. Kings do not murder. All that they do is right in God's eyes. My husband told me so. Parker shook his head. I would be beg to differ, madam. Aunt Nan rounded on him. Then you dispute with your king and commit treason. Her, fail, her face pale with fear. She bent forward. Be careful what you say, Matthew. I need you to be careful. Very, very careful. Remember your vow to me to keep Elizabeth safe and guide her. Help her to make not the same mistakes as her mother. If the good God permit. Nan, I vow I will keep Bess under my watch. He blinked at the window. Mal moment by moment, that the dark sky lightened. Kramer will be here soon. Do you wish for time alone in prayer before then? Aunt Nan shook her head and picked up her lute. She took his hand, smiling in reassurance. Nay, I think God will forgive me if I just allow myself the pleasure of staying with those I love these last hours. I shall pr play and sing a little while I wait for Kramer to bring the host. She played and sang. Dawn broke behind her, its light engulfing her in a net of gold. Birds chirped and twittered their joy and welcomed to another day's awakening. Too soon, approaching footsteps echo echoed outside the chamber. The heavy fall of thudding feet became louder and louder, like the beat of a drum, like the drub of a fr frightened heart, a march that trampled upon all songs.